Welcome back, everybody, to the Wiseman Say Podcast, powered by Yamo Media. Ty Fisher alongside Gerald Lucas. My mic needs to be here. There we go. My friend, how are you doing? I'm doing good. What is it with you and mics lately? Dude, I don't know, man. Look, I think I do everything good, and then I look at myself, and I'm like, fuck. This Jesus shit's not going to This shit's Christ. not gonna fucking work. The, no, leave me alone, okay? That one just kept falling down on me, okay? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing I'm doing pretty good though, man. You know, you gotta like uh gotta like the last, you know, I don't know what, four days. Dude, I've been on go mode since I got back from Minnesota. I mean, <laughs> Honestly, I've just been on nonstop fucking go since I got back from Minnesota. Hey, I mean it's coming it's coming to an end right now. You Thank know, God. of all these uh you know, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Tuesday games. Yeah, man. But uh, man, I'm excited. You know, to to talk about you know recapping these last two games. You know, because there's a lot to take away from them. Mm-hmm. Um, Definitely. And man, you know, you want the drum roll to 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 lay out the show for the the fine ladies and gentlemen at home. Um, I mean, we might as well just get right into it, right? Hey, I mean, we got a bunch to talk about. Some lovely news that I hold to, you know, place in my heart. And uh, yeah, let's let's dive feet first. Uh, diving feet first were the Columbus Crew into the swimming pool. That was the Chicago Fire match. Um, it, it, it was a very high pressing match, I would say. Right. Listen. I mean, we, we, you know, the Columbus crew dove into a burning ring of fire known as uh, the Chicago fire, you know, but uh, quote to Johnny Walker, you know, Johnny Cash. Um, Johnny we Walker. Fa- <laughs> I'm, the, I'm looking at a a commercial that was Johnny Walker commercial. So <laughs> leave me alone. Um, I mean, we fell into a burning ring of fire, but you know what? We put it out. Um, it was Columbus looked like they, they had just a whole week of rest, honestly, in my eyes, granted, they played what two days prior against Houston in yeah. like one of the CONCACAF champions cup. Yeah, so it, it was a quick turnaround. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what it is, if it was. The the fact that they probably had a straight f- flight from you know Houston to you know back to Columbus. That I was I was told that they leave like right after the match. Yeah. Even, even even when when they go to LA in July, that game's at seven thirty p.m. local time, so ten thirty p.m. here. After the game in LA, they're flying right back here to Columbus. Yeah, because they got to get ready for uh, – that's what, in July? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's where they got to get ready for uh, London, you know, England trying to invade uh, the United States again with sending over Aston Villa, you know, the following week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, two, two weeks after two that. Two weeks, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but they still got to get ready for the British invasion. Yeah, I, I think the match is on the 13th of July. And then the Aston Villa match is the twenty seventh. So I don't know. I don't think I don't know if it was this time around. It was a straight flight from Houston versus you know versus you know leaving Minnesota or going to you know like going to Minnesota. You know we had the week you know one week to prepare at home and then you know fly out to Minnesota. And we see how, you know, if it was that time change. Yeah. You know. And I'll tell you what, though. That time change kicked my ass. Golly. I found myself going to bed because, you know, I was in Minnesota for the game. I found myself going to bed at like 11 o'clock local time, central time, which was like 12 o'clock here. I'm like, dude, I don't know why I'm so tired. And I would just be like, I would I ate dinner. And then I would go back up to my room, play, you know, what I could 
of FIFA and Apex, Wi-Fi was absolute dog water. But I would find myself exhausted. And I just go to bed at like 11, 11.30 Central Time. And I, normally I'm up. I'm awake. Yeah. But, but nonetheless, getting back into the game, the, the Chicago match, Chicago obviously had what they had a week to prepare for us also. Yeah. I mean, I I told I told you uh, during the game, it was it was back to the old Chicago Columbus rivalry rivalry like back in the back in the day. You know, like it was you know the ketchup mustard battles and you know the actual when Chicago had the actual Maltese cross as their crest and you know they were relevant. Um. But, you know, we touched on it a little bit. I'm actually, you know, when we talked with, uh, oh, from Glasshouse, uh, Nick. Nick, that, you know, they, I was actually shocked Chicago opened up the piggy bank and brought in, you know, the players that they did. Yeah. You know, Kellen Acosta, which is, you know, yeah, he's getting up there in age, right? But he's still that vocal, you know, a leader. He's a veteran. He's got a, you know, he's got a cup. You know, he's played now in what two of them? You know, with that, with yeah. LAFC. Mm-hmm. You know, so he knows how he knows how to win, right? And then you go over there, you bring in um, Kuipers. Yep, Hugo Kuipers. Man, he he's gonna he's gonna make so if if everything can start clicking with that team, they're gonna make they're they'll be in either the play in game or the last last team in. Yeah, you know before the play the before the play in game. Yeah. So. Um. Obviously. When when what? Oh yeah, that's right. Um. Looking at the first half of that game, though, um, not a lot to take away, except for the fact that Columbus kind of started shaky. They did, uh, but you sort of—it's one of those things. The 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 technical staff for the Columbus crew—they're the unsung heroes, right? They're the true MVP of last season and so far this season right and and i must say that to say this that two years ago for the mls cup final next pro cup right Mm -hmm. marco sort of touched on it a little bit when they were playing st louis city too he said you know the training staff that they've done so much film work that they showed us like, look, this is what they do, you know, in the first 25 minutes. And we just bite our time, bite our time. So, and then, you know, we practice it out on the pitch, things like that. And then, you know, he said, surely enough in the 25th minute, yeah, you know, in the first 25 minutes after that, it just was like, okay, well, we've played, you know, this has played over my head so many times and we've done this in training now it now it's our turn so it's almost like just waiting and waiting and waiting and we saw that against chicago that columbus you know they did come out shaky not gonna log they came out a little sloppy right Mm -hmm. but at a certain point i think i saw the five minute intervals and heard uh i think either neil or lloyd sam say something about it that you know, after the 10 minute mark, Columbus started going. Yeah. You know, after the 15 minute mark, possession started going in favor of Columbus, right? Mm-hmm. Then there was that another, you know, 20, you know, at the 25th to say 32nd mark, I think it was, or the 25th to 30th, Chicago took over again and yeah. started. But then from the 35th, yeah, so from the 25th to the 35th, Chicago sort of started winning the possession battle back. 35th on to halftime, Columbus had the momentum going into the locker room. 
Yeah. Um, I think it reminded me a little bit of, of Minnesota, right? With the high press from Chicago, just like the high press from Minnesota, you know, it kind of, it was the same thing kind of over and over again where we gave up, we gave it the ball too many times, right? Yep. We gave the ball too many times in Minnesota. The one chance that Minnesota had was that team Puki uh, chance on Patrick Schulte, but he made, he Schulte made the save. It was kind of remnants of that. It was like, they forgot how to play the basic knowledge of soccer. Yeah. And Nancy wants, Nancy wants them to play, the, get back to playing normal soccer. Like just play soccer. It was almost like their feet had a mind of its own and it their or their feet weren't connected to their to their head. Mm-hmm. Right? There was some type of you know blockage in the, the neural transmitters from the head to the feet, tell you know, telling the feet what to do. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. and you saw it with the 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 you know the careless turnovers or the you know, get dispossessed and the, you know, sort of shrug, you know, drop your arms or drop, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's not crew side. That's, we're beyond that. That's Porter ball. Yeah. I, I, that's Porter ball. You know, you, you get dispossessed or you give a careless turnover and you're just like, you know, what the fuck, right? Yeah. You do the what the fuck motion, throw your arms up and throw it down. Mm-hmm. You know, you throw a little temper tantrum, right? Oh yeah, um, but now looking looking ahead to the second half, um, it got better for the crew. It did. Um, I can't remember who came out or Henestrosa came out in the second half at the 60th minute. Yeah, um, and we all know who came in. You know, none other than you know I could say it, but he's got like a head of broccoli hair. Oh, uh, Jason Russell Rowe, JRR, you know, the Cappy legend himself. Um, and I believe Farsi came on at the same time with him. Or uh, let me pull it up. I honestly don't remember. I'm going to pull it up because I believe it was Farsi and Jason or Marrera and Jason. It was. Uh, uh, it was Jason and Steven. Okay, so yeah, at the 60th minute mark, it was Jason and Steven that came in. Oh. Um, and then you had, you know, they, they changed the dynamic, right? Nancy likes to talk about, you know, the profiles. Yeah. Those two coming in, you change the dynamic, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you got 60 minutes for Henestrosa so the rest of the world can see him. You know, at Lower.com and how amazing of a player he he's going to be. Yeah. Um, and you, you just, I mean, you just saw it, right? You know, you you take out Nagby, which I think he played the whole 90 in Houston on on the you know on that Wednesday. Um, I, I, for some reason, I thought he got taken out in the second half. He might, ha- he might have later in the match because Derek Jones did come in. So, um, you know, we got a little taste of Derek Jones down there in Houston last Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. He, he came out in the 90th minute for Yaboa. Yeah. Um, you know, so you change the dynamic by bringing in Marrera. Uh, I think we saw Sawaski move up. Yes. To, to yep. play the winger. And, yeah. you know, Jason and, uh, man, I'll tell you what, that, 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 that dynamic right there, just changing that part was exciting to see, you know, mm-hmm. in the second half. Yeah. Um, midway through the second half, though, um, Columbus get the breakthrough. Get the breakthrough. Jason Russell Rowe 
goal from outside of the 18-yard box, picked out the lower left-hand uh, corner of Chris Brady. Or Brady, yeah, Chris Brady. Yeah. I was about to say Brady Scott. Brady Scott's ours. <laughs> no, he's um, with Brady Scott's now with the Galaxy. Oh, really? Yeah, they signed him. Oh shit! All right, they signed him to a first team. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, good, good on Brady Scott. I like him. Um, picking out the lower left hand corner of the net to make it one nothing for Columbus. Just eight minutes. Sorry, seven minutes. No. Yeah, eight minutes after he came on. Yeah, eight minutes or nine. Actually, actually nine minutes. They credited in the 68th. Six, yeah, so 15, 10, so nine, nine minutes. Whatever. Nonetheless, just mere minutes come after coming on, Jason Russell Rowe gets the breakthrough for Columbus 1 0. So to, to, to go back and set that whole play up, right? Mm hmm. Chicago went on the attack. Patrick, you know, for some somehow Patrick Schulte had the ball. All right. Got the ball to Amundsen. This man, you know, that man's underrated as well. The way he sees the field and he can find those passes. He, you know, he started dribbling, started dribbling. He found Jason sitting there. He got Jason the that ball. Jason made a beautiful turn and started driving, right? Mm -hmm. He had Cucho coming up to his his right. He had Yao out there on the out on his left, right? Yep. Crashing with him. Now, this is where I love that he has become selfish. Because he would have, you know, he would have passed it to Cucho. Yeah. He took that shot. And you even hear Neil Sika on the broadcast talk about how that was a knuckle of a shot. It knuckled, it, it curved like a knuckleball. Mm -hmm. And there was no way Brady, you know, Chris Brady was, was going to stop it. Yeah. And, you know, he talked about it, you know, following the, the game. He said, you know, he was looking at Kucho, but he just didn't feel like that was the right pass to do. So he took the shot. And he used his right foot. I'm going to emphasize that again. He used his right foot. Because uh, I don't know what's going on with his left foot. But I don't think his left foot likes to score. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all um so moving on one nothing columbus right um and then we get the equalizer goal from uh from chicago um in the i want to say like five minutes later four minutes later 72nd minute fabian herbers gets the game time goal um subject to offside um, i still think it was offside but it, it it wasn't. I after seeing it so many times, it, it he's he's behind the ball when the pass is played. The, um, the second one, right? The first one before he, um, Shakiri got the ball because Shakiri is the one that had it. Right before Shakiri got it, Shakiri was offside. So I can't remember who it was, but somebody's leg was back behind. Was it? It was just like remember Derek Etienne's game winner goal, or uh, game tying goal against yeah Cincinnati. game tying goal against Cincinnati a couple years ago, and it was somebody's like leg that kept them on. It was that. Yeah. It was that. Which is nuts, but you know it is. Yeah, it is, but. It, uh, the game's brutal sometimes. I mean, but at that point, that was honestly, you know, a breakdown with the defense. Yeah. Um, not clearing it out. And, you know, Fabian Herbers picks up the rebound. Yeah. Um, so, subject to VAR video review, goal was given, and now it's 1-1. Now it seems like Columbus has their back against the wall. 
because they let in that that equalizer, and now you know time's running out. Now their backs against the wall. Yeah, Chicago. Once they got that equalizer, it looked like Chicago just wanted to escape Columbus with the point. Yeah, they were almost happy to escape with the point. Hmm. Um. But I still don't know how the hell you get. 12 minutes of second half stoppage time. I really don't. We look at everything that happened. Both teams used all five subs, right? You had a VAR review. You had a video review. You had two goals. You had an injury. In my head, I'm thinking that's probably seven or eight minutes. Correct. That's what I was looking at, too. But if, when... if, if they're wanting to tally up the entire time, I think that's seven to eight minutes. I mean, it could also be, too, some of the time wasting. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's I, – I guess that's true also. You know, but nonetheless, I'll take it. Um, in Except the, for your recap. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, <laughs> I hated that shit so much. I hate that, man. I hate that because I, I want to get my stuff done right at the final. I want to get it submitted so that way it's one of the first ones out after the final whistle, right? Mm-hmm. Nope. Mo far, she said, no, Fisher, you're not doing this. You're, you're not writing this off just yet. Mo said, hold my beer. You're not writing this off just yet, man. 90 plus 10, the latest game, the latest goal, is, I think it's the latest game-winning goal. Latest t- uh, tie game. So game winning goal. Game winning goal in club history, which yeah. was which was set just a couple of days couple ago of by days the time. <laughs> yeah, was 90 plus six. Uh, 90 plus two. <clears throat> so we're looking at the 100th minute of play right now. Uh, Mo Farsi, I, 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 I had no idea how this how this even happened. Uh, it was a throw in, mm. thrown to Jason. Jason squares it to Rossi. Rossi with a sliding shot that's saved by Brady. And Farsi follows up, slots in the back of the net, and lower.com erupts in pandemonium. Well, so if you take a look at that, that throw in, right? It was a quick restart on that throw in. Mm-hmm. Jason chested the throw in perfectly to his feet right drove made the pass between the chicago defenders legs who fouled rossi rossi had a a clean shot had he decided to go a little bit higher than brady but when he shot it it was low enough to where brady had to dive and there was nobody marking mo yeah and here comes mo Bigger hole than, you know, the top of Mount St. Helens. And just says, I hear, I'll take a game winning for 500, Alex. You know, and just like you said, lower.com erupted. Yeah. 20,000, I think it was what, 20,200 and some fans, you know, were out. 20,327. Okay, so 20,327 fans. My, you know, you got to mark off the section for sector, uh, sector Latino that, you know, was there. So just all the fans erupted, whether it was a boo, whether it was, you know, cheering, the jackhammer going, smoke going. Mo Farsi made history. And, I mean, Columbus is a is a team for first, right? Mm-hmm. You know, ma- you know, breaking you know history records, and that was his first MLS career goal with the team, which it should have been more. You know, he should have had more, but just you know, he didn't have the luck of the ball. But that was his second goal with the club. Following the the one uh, one nil win over Indy Eleven in the U.S. Open Cup last year. Yep. And um, boy, 
But three points. Uh, we still remain unbeaten uh, in three matches in the league. So I guess we're starting off on the right foot. Um, but now, quick turnaround. And now we have leg two of the CONCACAF Champions Cup against the Houston Dynamo. Real quick about that win. Through three games, or two, yeah, three games, I think it's two games at home now. Um, yes. Columbus has opened up, you know, through like the first three weeks of, <clears throat> three weeks of the year winning at home unbeaten in you know like the first three games of the season dating back to 2021 i believe i can't find the notes uh rob had you know posted about it on the on twitter um but they got a streak of you know home wins <laughs> mm-hmm. so and the fun game is, you know, we're about to talk about the fun game. Um, so as I said before, quick turnaround. Now, uh, this past Tuesday, the second leg of the CONCACAF Champions Cup against the Houston Dynamo. Columbus came into this match up one nothing on aggregate with that away goal advantage, which was a big factor heading into this match. Um, and now we have all to play for a spot in the quarterfinals. We have all, but we have a foot already in the door with that away goal advantage. Right. Yeah. That's... Uh, um, but this match was a pretty, I, for me, it seemed dull at times. You're correct. Right. Uh, there, there wasn't too much action in the first 40 minutes, right? I think it was more or less. I think it was more or less Columbus trying to see what uh, Ben Olsen put out there. Yeah. You know, to see, you know, how that lineup that he put out there was going to, you know, work. Um. And I've, I've said it all the time. Lower.com is, you know, people don't like coming to Lower.com. Teams hate to come here. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not throwing, you know, batteries or beer on people. Uh, I mean, over in the Nordeca, they probably are, you know, because they're cheering because of a goal. <laughs> and, you know, some of the Nordeca members like, you know, like taking beer showers. Um, But it just – wasn't too it didn't evoke too many emotions in the first 40 minutes right um there was one part that evoked emotions <laughs> and I, I think i can just say you know kucha hernandez just doing kucha hernandez things so i went back and watched that pl- that that the sequence right it was a long ball that was being played to Cucho that was intercepted and headed back to Ramirez. And you can see it caught him off guard that the ball was coming to him. And just, you know, that connection there, I mean, it's – that connection goes more than just the field, you know what I'm saying, between those two and – Somebody, you know, let, you know, powered up and be, you know, went and in, turned into Super Saiyan God mode. You know, sporting the new hair, you know, the platinum hair. Um, and you know, faked out Steve Clark. You know, Cucho has this thing that he, you know, when he'll stare the the keeper down as he's going, you know, coming at you. He'll st- you know, he'll stare the the keeper down, and then when the keeper thinks that he's gonna go the right way, Cucho just somehow has that ability to crank the ball the opposite direction. 
So, um, one nothing Columbus. Now we're up two nothing on aggregate. Right? How are you? How are you feeling when you saw that? When what? he scored, knowing that you know we've had trouble closing out games. How did you feel seeing the two the two zero aggregate lead? I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty comfortable with it up until about midway through the second half. Fair, right? Only because now second half was pretty was probably the most boring half of soccer I've ever seen. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. It allowed me to get a lot of my recap done, however, so I'm happy about that. Okay. Um, but up until I say probably about the uh, where'd it go? That's that. Where did there it is? I'd say probably up until the where's the possession breakdown? They don't have the possession breakdown on, on the freaking thing. Um, anyway, probably up until about the 70th minute, I think it was, um, I was like, score like one or two more, just put this thing to bed, right? Because it, then it puts more pressure on, it would have put more pressure on Houston to score, you know, one, two or three more goals in order to make a game out of this yeah. right it it it, it would have been if, if we scored one more to make it two nothing make a three nothing on our aggregate they would need to score four or two yeah they need to score four yep right they need to score four goals in order to make a game out of it and put us on on the thing to score uh what Two. Two more, I think it would be, because, yeah. yeah. So, score one or two more, put this thing to bed, and we can all go home happy, right? But then, I, I, I had no idea why this was called. 90th minute, Houston gets a penalty. From everything, from everybody I heard from, it was soft. It was not soft. That was deliberate. <laughs> what, what what have you been? What have you seen? I didn't get a chance to see the rest of you know look at it. Um, from what I was told, it yes, it was a, it was a penalty, but it was one of the soft ones. Did they um, did, did they say anything as to why it was a, why it was called a penalty? Like what action was called? I have to. Uh, I think from what I heard was I can't remember exactly what I heard. You know, watching some of the highlights, but I need to go back and have it turn it back on. Mm -hmm. You know, so I could finish doing my recap. Uh but from fans that are, you know that were sitting back there, I mean, it just was one that they looked at it and saw that it was. They said it was soft and that there was no card given, so it was like there there wasn't because it, it and there wasn't a card given, but it was it was a handball. Steve, it, it's it was a handball on Steven. Aye, aye, aye. It, if you if you watch it, if you watch it. The ball gets sent in, right? And Steven goes up and he lifts his hand up and it just hits his hand. Like he literally just goes like this and <laughs> it hits his hand. <laughs> like that's good. So whatever people are saying that's soft. No way that's soft. That's clear as day. That's clear as day. I I hate to be that I hate to be that guy, but you guys are you guys don't uh, weren't looking at the wrong thing, honestly. Hey, I'm just saying what you know was being said. Oh, I didn't I see it. <laughs> I didn't see it, 
and I haven't, you know, unfortunately I wasn't able to pay attention to, you know, the end part of the game. I had no idea why it was called, honestly. All I heard, I was right. All I heard was a whistle, and I look and I see the ref point to the spot. I'm like, well, what the hell it's like, what the hell happened here? Um, but Houston get a penalty kick. Griffin Dorsey uh, converts. Schulte gets the right way. Got a hand on it. Yeah. Got a hand on it. Uh, and now it's 1 1. And now it's. All right. Close this thing out. Close it out. That's all you need to do. Just close it out. Yep. Um, four minutes of stoppage time. I think there should have been just a tad bit more of stoppage time added on. It should have been six. In in my yeah, to get to the penalty and everything like that and, and whatnot. Um, but nonetheless, the crew closed it out. And now we're into the quarterfinals of the CONCACAF Champions Cup. Which uh, you know, we had to wait a couple hours, you know, after the match to see who would take you know, who would be taking on. And had we scored some more goals. It would have been, you know, just like this Houston series, away home. But nonetheless, we get a team that has not played. You know, Columbus has not played. Or I believe they might have played them, right? Not that I remember. Uh, so... We, we get not, not that I remember. I don't think they've ever played. We get to play Tigers. Yep. And you know what? This is where I wish uh, I, I missed Lucas because this would have been a special match. Yeah. You know. But, I mean, it's a business, right? That's what all sports are. It, it's a business, and... I'm excited. Oh man, yeah, same. same. I'm really excited. If I had the money, the passport, I'd be applying for credentials to go down to down to Mexico. Yes, yeah. To t- you know to to cover the Tigers game. Yeah, um, and just by looking at the atmosphere from just highlights when uh, when the Orlando Tigers match came out. That looks like a very intimidating atmosphere, honestly. Man, so I mean, I, I watched it. I watched Tigers come out to a two nil, you know, lead in early in the first half, and then Orlando, you know, came back, got a uh, earned a penalty kick, converted on it. So it was a two one, and it just it just seemed like Tigers just channeled the fans and just took off. I will say one thing. I'm happy we're not covering the Philadelphia Union. <laughs> I'm happy we're not covering the Philadelphia Union. Um but no and and there is a, there is a bit of controversy with this I think. I'd have to look again. But apparently or I, I don't know if this is Whatever. Um, apparently, the second leg of the quarterfinal would be hosted by Columbus on April 9th. The same day as the She Believes Cup final that's here in Columbus. However, I did see something that it, it's flipped. Columbus would host the first leg. Tigress would hold the second leg. Correct, because uh, had, like I said, had Columbus scored more goals, Columbus would have been the second leg host, and Tigers would have hosted first. Because when it flips, you know, when it comes to the the next round, whoever had the most goals on aggregate would have, you know, would have the hosting rights. Okay, for the second leg. And that was from what I read from Brianna. Okay. You know, she posted a tweet about it saying, you know, due to this, 
you know, not having the the goals, you know, more goals than Tigris. Yeah. We host the first round the or first, first leg. leg. Tigris would host the second. Makes sense also. And I would also think that if we were to host the second leg, I'm sure that this match would be moved to a, probably like a day before, a day after, or whatnot, after she believes Cup. Well, I think the second legs are the, between the 9th and the 11th. The The entire quarterfinals is between April 2nd and April 11th. But I'm just saying, if the second leg is April 9th and we were to host, it would be moved before or after the She Believes Cup. Well, it would have to be the day after because you can't go before um, earlier in the day because there's two games on, you know, two games at lower.com for She Believes Cup. I'm not saying earlier in the day. I'm saying the day before. Day before the day after, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could always open up the gates at Historic Crew Stadium. No. That's turf, though. That's turf. I know. I'm... That that's that's turf. I I wouldn't put that on the guy's legs. So I mean at all. I hate playing on turf. Turf sucks. But I mean I'm I'm excited to see how Tigers travels. They are, they'll travel. You know, because if it's like Club America, then they'll, they'll travel. Man, they'll travel. Um, shifting gears to. Columbus Crew 2 um, just announced today. Gerald, this is something that's very near and dear to your ever kind heart. Um, <laughs> we got news a couple days before the Crew 2 season kicks off of a coach. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cappy's Corner. And, you know, First game of the season is literally Sunday. And, you know, we've been without a head coach for for the Cappies since the man himself, uh, Laurent Cortal, took the head coaching job up at CF Montreal. And so everybody has been wondering and asking who's the new head coach. You know, great, we're signing these used to, you know, next pro contracts or we're bringing in players, you know, from other academies or teams. But who's going to be the head coach? And, you know, at one point in time, there was a guessing game. It was, it, you know, is, is Bez or Corey going to go talk to Inter Miami and bring back people, you know, to Columbus to coach crew too? Is it going to be Josh Williams? Um, nonetheless, they promote within – as they always talk about the player pathway to the first team. I think it, it also goes the same for coaches as Kelvin Jones was promoted to the head coaching job of the Cappies. And he has a quite, quite a, 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 a nice background, you know, started out with the Academy U 12, moved up to the 15s to the 19s. Academy director. He was the U17 men's uh, youth national head coach. Uh, I believe it says what? Uh, last year, he was the UPSL head, uh, team head coach for the Crew Academy that made the final four in its first season in UPSL. And now. He's the crew two head coach. So, Cappies, don't worry. You guys are all in good hands, just like Allstate. Um, really quick, um, how do you think he does in his first year? I think he do, I think he does. I think it's playoff team. Um, I think it's a. I think crew two would be a playoff team. Uh, the benefit of him is he was an assistant under Laurent mm -hmm. uh, the first 
two years, right? And he's learned so much from Nancy. And I didn't know this about him, but he got his license from from over there in France. I did not know that. So, and you and me have talked about it before that the French teams run the the three back system. Yeah. So this is huge that we have a coach that went through the through France to get their coaching license. Right? To be able to coach at the at this level. And I just think with all the talent I I sort of see what they're doing that after so many years with crew two that they're either re-signing them or they're you know loaning them out or they're releasing them to make way for up and coming academy the way that crew that next pro was supposed to be of uh, developing like the academy players mm-hmm. it seems like they're going from the academy to the upsl team some going to upsl some going to crew two playing on uh uh, uh, an amateur contract, yeah, you know, the homegrown contract or whatever it is. Um, and seeing what they got at that level, and then if not, you know, you're you're right at the UPSL team and bringing some of those UPSL guys up. Uh, but it, it's, I, I think Corey Ray's got it now, right where it needs to be, and how it's how it was supposed to be Mm -hmm. Uh, but Corey Ray and what he's done for crew two is the blueprint you know for next pro yeah you know hands down show me another show me another next pro team that has a better blueprint than Corey Ray I'll tell you none of them do you know so that's how it's supposed to be. I think it's a play. I think they're a playoff team. Mm-hmm. I think they're maybe a two seed. Okay. Two or three seed. Um. Do I see a next pro cup final? Yeah. I'm going to say 65% yes. Okay. Um, But there's still that 35% that it'll be a playoff team. Maybe get to the next pro Eastern conference final. Uh, But if they go all the way in Kelvin's first year and win it all, there's nothing you could tell me about crew two, the front office for crew two, and you know, the way that everybody's bought in from the first team all the way down on Nazi. Yeah. And Bez talked about it that they like being a club of one. So I think he does I think he does pretty good. And this is where you get a chance to now see uh Muhammad Saad. Uh, you get to see more of uh, Brent Adu uh, Gianfi. Uh, you get to see more uh, Chase Chase Adams. You get to see more Chris Rogers. You know, thing you know, players like that that were exciting. Yeah. Um, you get to see more of that. You get to see Stoss grow. You know, as a keeper. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Maybe even get a chance to see some more Taha and and Cole once uh, Cole Maroka once the the season starts, which by the way is like I said Sunday, I believe at three o'clock at Historical Crew Stadium, taking on the Red Bull Two, you know, Red Bull Twos of New York, or New Jersey. Moving ahead, uh, predictions. Back in doing the doing our league predictions right now. Let's get them loaded, shall we? Um. So, first up, 
on Saturday, kicking off the afternoon. Um, we have Chicago and Montreal from Soldier Field. By the way, all games are free this weekend on Apple TV. Um, so everybody can watch their favorite team for free. If you Which have huge. the Apple TV app on a look on a on your phone or on your laptop if you have a MacBook, or if you have the actual Apple TV box, you can uh get that and watch your favorite team. Which that's huge for Apple. You hear me? Yeah, I'm waiting on your prediction. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm going with it. I'm staying with the Red Hot Montreal and the Fighting Laurents. Chicago does play a little better at home sometimes. It's a 2 p.m. kickoff. Montreal's riding a high of being the inner Miami uh, Messies. Mm-hmm. I'm going 2 1. 2 1 Montreal? Yeah. Um, give me one nothing Montreal. One nothing Montreal. Yeah. Uh, next up, also at two o'clock, DC United, Inter Miami from Audi Field. Is Messi playing? I have no idea, honestly. That's you know. That's the that's the thing. If Messi's playing, I take Inter Miami over DC. I'm not putting mm-hmm. a score on it. Okay. If Messi is not playing, I go draw. Okay. No uh no scoreline. If so, Messi's uh, not if if Messi's not playing, then it's gonna be two two draw. Okay. And it also depends too if Christian Benteke is playing. Okay. But I see if Messi's not playing and Christian is playing, I see a 2-2 draw. If Messi does play, I'm not even going to put a, a score prediction on it. Well, I'm, I have to for the show. Um, not necessarily. 3-1 if Messi plays. Okay. 3-1 Miami? Yeah. Okay. Um, the... Saturday matinee, three thirty, Seattle Sounders, Colorado Rap- Colorado Rapids, from Lumen Field. That's in Seattle. I'm gonna have to go Seattle. Um, Colorado did pick up some steam with uh, beating Real Salt Lake. I wish they heavily needed that, but uh, I just think Seattle's a little bit more dominant than Colorado right now because Colorado's mm-hmm. still trying to build that chem- that on-field chemistry and, and that on-field game chemistry. It's one thing to have the chemistry in training, but it's the other and another thing to translate that over to game day. So they're still trying to figure out the game day, you know, Chemistry. I think it's a it's a one nil Seattle. I just realized I didn't give my prediction for DC Miami. So I'm I'm gonna go two nothing Miami. Gotcha. Um, for this one, I'm probably gonna go one one draw. That's fair. I yeah, I'll probably go one one draw. Um to start the seven thirty matchups, New York City, Toronto FC from Yankee Stadium. I am going to go with a one one draw. Okay. I, I think it's a great test for Toronto, a new look Toronto. Um, everybody's jo- bought, bought into John Herdman. Yeah. Um, and you could tell. 
uh, because you see a different side of Bernadeschi, you see a different side of Insigne. And, oh, my God, his goals so far are bangers this year, uh, which I think he got goal of the week for his, you know, his banger against Charlotte. Second right? second in a row. Yeah, so they, everybody's bought into John Herdman. Yeah. Um, they did just make a trade today of Latif, uh, Latif Blessing. To Is Houston. it official? I, I I saw I saw it was wait who Toronto? Yeah, I saw he was going to Houston. That's what I said. That Toronto traded Latif Blessing to Houston. I thought Latif Blessing was with LAFC. Mm, no, he was with Toronto. Was he with Toronto? I could be wrong. No, you're right. Oh, because t- Tom Bogart used a picture of Latif Blessing in an LA FC jersey. <laughs> so, you know, Houston picks up a midfielder that they desperately need right now mm-hmm. with uh, Ferrer being out. But this is going to be a tough test for the new look uh, Reds of Toronto going up against the Pigeons of New York City, who I, I believe they played Portland last week that, you know, gave up a, a heartbreaking goal to Evander from Portland, mm-hmm. you know, late in the game. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go 2-1 Toronto. Are uh, you buying into John Herman too? Uh, I mean, you can just see the difference that he's made in the club. They got rid of the to- toxicity in there. Both Bradleys well, yeah, are gone. But, but yeah, but I mean, you can just see the difference that he's made so far with the club. Take take a look at what he's done with the Canadian national team, right? He's 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 doing what Wilfred Nancy has done in his first year. He's he's giving some of these young players chances. Yeah. And case in point, look at Jason Russell Rowe. He called him up to the Canadian national team last year for Gold Cup, and he contributed. Mm-hmm. He, you know, on that one PK that I think that kept Canada in it, you know, against the United States down in Cincinnati, he drew that penalty, which Schaffelberg is the one that took it. You know, so. Herdman, you know, if he sees the potential there for a young player, he gives him the chance. Yeah. You know, versus the toxicity that was there with both Bradleys last year. You know, Bob Bradley, you know, has told young talent, you know, young players that you're, you know, you're nothing, you know, you're not that good of a player. I don't even know why you're playing. You're not going to see any minutes, you know, just being toxic. And I think that's why you saw Insigne and Bernardeschi sort of give up on Toronto and was talking about, like, I want to go back to Italy. You know, and here comes John Herdman, and he's changed the atmosphere. And you see it in the crowd there, you know, for when Toronto's at home, you just see the the vibrance and the, you know, the, the jubilation from Toronto fans. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moving on um, eight 30 matchups, Austin, Philadelphia from Q2 stadium, Philly. Philly's pissed off. Yeah. You know, they got embarrassed against Pachuca in the second leg of the CCC. Their game against, was it Seattle? No. Yeah, against Seattle got postponed six minutes into it because apparently, you know, players couldn't see each other with the way that the rain was coming down. Um. So I think they're going to take it out on Austin, and I sort of feel bad for them. Not really, but I feel bad because you're you're going up against a pissed-off Philly team. 
So they're more they're more dangerous because of one not getting a full game last Saturday, two being embarrassed the way they were in Mexico. I mean, six nothing, really. That's. I mean, at that point, you're pulling the goalie in hockey, right? You're pulling him and you know changing goalies, right? So can't do that here in in soccer, but it just. I think it's going to be a three nil thrashing in front of the the fans down there at Q two Stadium. Um, I got two two. Uh, Dallas, Vancouver from Toyota Stadium. I'm actually going to go with a Dallas. Two nil. Um, I like. I like two one Dallas. Okay, that's two, fair. One. Houston, Portland, Shell Energy Stadium. <laughs> um, didn't these two teams already play? No. Nah. Oh yeah, that was important than Colorado. That was a four nil. Um or one. I I I think it's gonna be I'm going Portland. They just had a signing as well. Uh I can't remember the name of the player, but uh I think Portland gets it. Um two, I think you said what? Two, two one. one. I was gonna say the same thing. Two two one Portland. Um, KC San Jose Children's Mercy Park, Kansas City. Uh, two. I'm gonna go. Excuse me. Three one. Um. Give me one nothing Kansas City. Okay. Minnesota LAFC Allianz Field. I'm going to pull the upset. Minnesota, 1-0 over LAFC. Give me 2-1 Minnesota. They've been on they've been on a they've been good so far and they just I they think they came from behind to, they beat, did. to beat Orlando last week. They gave up the the league's fastest goal in regulation in 13 seconds. Yeah. To Duncan McGuire. Is that is that the league's fast? I thought the league's fastest was like seven seconds. They said it, it was, was years ago. They said it was a uh, league record. Okay. Oh, go, that that, that might have been a playoff game I'm thinking of. Possibly. A while ago. Like a long time ago. Um. Nashville, Charlotte, Geodas Park. Nashville, 2 0. Um, give me a 1 1 draw. Copetti's hurt. Give me a 1 1 draw. 1 1 draw? Yeah. So I have. <laughs> there we go. I looked down and there was a piece of paper on my keyboard. Uh oh. Yeah. I can't get it now. That's why you need to have an air can. Yeah, I know. I need to get one. Anyway, I almost got it. <laughs> All right, there we go. Oh, oh open up coding. operation. Oopsie. All right. Um, rounding out the night, L.A., St. Louis from Dignity Health Sports Park. Give me the Galaxy. I think it's going to be a 3-2 match. 2-0 uh, Galaxy. Hey, they're looking pretty good. They are. <laughs> On Sunday, 2 o'clock, Revolution FC Cincinnati from Gillette Stadium. 
One one draw. Okay. I just don't know what uh you know Cincinnati's gonna be traveling from Mexico. You know, they play they play, you know, they play down in, you know, Monterey for the second leg. So now they have to travel back and it's two and a wake up, you know, for them to go from Mexico back to Cincinnati, train for a day or recover for a day, and then have to fly out to Foxborough, mm-hmm. you know, to play New England, which New England can also be the same too. You know, could be feeling the same way. I doubt it. You never know. Um, just Cincinnati's not playing good soccer right now. Yeah. You know, they're sitting, I think, what, fifth or sixth in the league right now. Um, they are seventh. Oh, no. The reigning supporter shield winner is in seventh place right now. Yep. So one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to dig yourself into an early hole in the beginning part of the season. Yeah. Because now you're start now you have to start clawing your way out of that hole. So give me a one one draw. You know, especially you got Porter. And Porter loves playing against Cincinnati. Yeah. It's either a draw or a win, right? Oh yeah. Um, Atlanta, Orlando, seven o'clock Sunday for Mercedes Benz Stadium. You mean Atlanta, man? They're hot. They started find they found their their lane and they started driving in it. Yeah, right. So, can be Atlanta. I think Orlando does get two goals, but I think Orlando. I think it's Atlanta four two. By the way, give me two one New England. <laughs> Give me 2-2 two, two, Atlanta, Orlando. Okay. All right. Um, now, the match that we've all been waiting for, I'm going to see if I can do something really quick. Um, the match that we've all been waiting for, and it is... Columbus Red Bulls. Now, I'm going to see if I can do something really quick here. Uh Uh-oh, you and your creation. Present. Uh... Oh, man. All right, hang on. I can do this way. Um, oh no. I I know I know what I can do. I know exactly what I can do. Give me one second here. Uh while I pull this up, Gerald, what is your key to the game for um Red Bulls and um Columbus? Stay on task. Is there any other key to the game besides that? <laughs> I did ask Nazi about that uh, a couple weeks ago. What is, you know, when you tell the players what is, you know, stayed on task mean? Is it a personal goal, team goal? He went into a a, a great breakdown of it, so it's too much to talk about. But um, fitness, stamina, heavy legs, right? Um. Can you stay? Can you stay? Uh, you know how fit are you actually? You know, mm-hmm. can you keep up that energy? Because you know, it's it's a it's an energy drink team, right? So they're they're playing with high energy. Yeah, they're playing with the Red Bulls gives you wings type mentality, right? So. It was a tough test last year. Nazi loves, you know, saying Red Bulls is one of the tests. 
for the team. Philly and 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 New York and the Red Bulls are one of the teams that are the two teams that Nazi calls test, right? Um limit the turnovers, the careless turnovers. And just play, you know, keep playing, you know, get back to your basics. Re- get respect your roots and get back to your roots. You know, for this match. Yep. Um, as you guys can see on the screen, kit matchups uh, are posted. I posted it on Twitter, um, but for those who have not seen it yet, um, when this recording happened, Columbus will be wearing their Velocity kits, Patrick Schulte in purple. Red Bulls will be wearing their yellow kits, uh, yes. Carlos Cornell in green. My phone is ringing. I don't have time to answer it. Um Referees will be in blue. Um, obviously, don't know who the referees are yet. Uh, that will be posted Saturday after noon uh, for matches um, starting at 7.30 or later. And as far as we know, it is subject to change. Uh, Gerald, can you see my screen? Can you see the thing move? I can. Uh, the Ohio Health Availability Report has to be determined on it. So as of right now, it is a clean slate, um, but that is subject to change. Yeah. So um, I would assume that we will get a more updated one probably Friday. Yep. Afternoon. With right who around is officially... 5 o'clock. Huh? Right around 5 o'clock. Yeah. Who is more... Who is actually out and who is actually questionable or if it is a clean slate it'll just stay the same so we will update you guys when that becomes available um but gerald prediction for columbus um red bulls 2-1 columbus i kind of like that also i like 2-1 columbus also it's it's a good healthy you know not too bold prediction from you, but it's a good good medium that 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 we can set at. I'm being smart on this one. You know, I mean, have they played Cincinnati yet? No, they haven't. Who? Columbus? Red Bulls. No. Um, so they haven't really gone up against a team like Columbus, right? So, you know, not knowing what to expect from the Red Bulls. Mm-hmm. Um. So I mean, it's I'm I'm going smart with this one too. One. Um, could be more, could be less. It could be a draw, but I, I I'm liking the chance. Two one Columbus. Um, looking ahead, or actually not looking ahead now. <laughs> um, hold on, your pick. I said two one. You did okay. Yeah, I was, I was like, yeah, I said the same thing. Um, yellow card, red card. <laughs> I got a yellow card. Okay. And it's coaches that are dicks. That, you know, when you have reporters sitting there trying to do their job, don't be a dick. And, you know, act the way, you know, act like a child in the, in the post game. And yeah, you know, yes, I am talking about Ben Olsen. The way his attitude, you know, towards reporters, you know, after the second leg against Houston. So, I mean, we get emotions are still running high, you know, coming off of, you know, whether it's a win or it's a loss. Just don't be a dick. You know, uh, and red card. I'm gonna have to say my damn leg. I can't get I can't get the swelling of my leg to go down. It looks like the cellulitis might be coming back. Just at this point, just cut my fucking leg off. Make me buy make me Robocop. <laughs> um I don't think I have one, honestly. 
Um, no more Ubers getting T-boned? No, but I did have a... Okay, maybe this is a rat or... or yeah, I don't know. Take it how you will. It's I was on the way to the stadium yesterday, and I was in my Uber going from work to the stadium. And we're on 70 by Children's Hospital. And driver gets over into the right lane, gets over into the the farthest lane on the outside and he starts driving because there's no cars and all of a sudden this 18 wheeler that's in front of us decides to veer over pull over right in front of us and almost drive us off the road aye, aye, aye. and it's right where the construction starts because you know they're building that overpass yeah Cambridge yeah it's right where it's right where that construction starts <laughs> so Take take with that information as you will. You tell me if it's a yellow card or a red card. Um, it's a it's a blue. <laughs> it's a, okay, okay, we're going <laughs> blue now. Got it. Um, I think that's the only thing that's been happening so far. So I mean, it is what it is. So, um, anything else? Well, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned and uh, keep your eyes open because uh, we got some things happening. Probably in the next couple weeks, maybe a month or so. Um, go buy some gear. Our store uh, store link is on our Twitter. And uh, in case you miss an episode, go find us wherever you get your podcast at. As you can see there on on the taskbar, on the little scrolly bar, maybe um, wherever you get your podcast. Watch us on YouTube, Spotify, and on Ghost TV. Um, coming up here on the Wesman Say podcast, Bob Ventimiglia from I 80 Sports helps us preview the Red Bull side of the Columbus Red Bulls match. And uh, great talk with him. Um, and uh, we will see what he has to say or what you guys will see what he has to say. Uh, coming up here on the Wesman Say podcast, we'll be right back after this. Can't wait for the Metro Stars. All right, cool. Coming up at five, four, three, two. Welcome back, everybody, to the Wiseman State Podcast, powered by Yamo Media, Ty Fisher, alongside Gerald Lucas and Bob Ventimiglia. I got Thank that you. right. <laughs> uh, with uh, the Designated Pundits podcast, MLS on I-80 Sports. Uh, me and you talked uh, before the season, doing a preview of the Columbus crew. Um, how did that go? How, did it sound good? Or... Yeah, everything was great. I mean, what, what an incredible series. I, I was so lucky to get 29 of like the best podcast hosts. I got play-by-play announcers, color commentators from every team. It's so great just taking it all in. I, I don't need to be on my A game, just point the finger, hey, you talk. Uh, one of my favorite things to do each season really gives us a good uh, clue of where the league stands. Cool. Um, how are you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. Uh, I started my master's, so I'm, I'm a little busy, but... Uh, Soccer season, you know, it's finally here. This is what we waited for. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so you may uh, primarily cover the Red Bulls, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that is leading up right into the Columbus Crew game against the Red Bulls this Saturday uh, at Lower Dockham Field. But let's talk more about the Red Bull side, uh, the Sandra Schwartz impact. Uh, how is he doing? What do you like from him? What do you like out of the team that's under him? And uh, just talk about uh, his impact on the team so far. Yeah, so I went to media day, and it was the most positive experience I've had in a very long time being anywhere near Red Bull Arena. Everyone was bought into the system. Sandra Schwartz has done a fantastic job getting everyone acclimated. He has Lewis Morgan. That's a huge piece you need to incorporate in from last season, who was missing almost the entire year with an injury. Got Emil Forsberg, who's going to be the MLS newcomer of the year in 2024. I have no doubt in my mind about that. He's already contributing on the field, looking like an all-star. So he had a lot of pieces coming together, being a new coach, but Red Bull, this is a system that we know. We know what they have. We know what they're going to be each year. We're not reinventing the wheel. It's still the same high-press team who's going to look to steal the ball in your half of the field and and turn that into points. So 
while some things are new, some things are going to stay the same. And I, I think that Sandro's done a fantastic job just from the first few games. The one thing that really sticks out, and this is kind of a complaint for, I think all MLS fans for every team, no matter what team you follow, you always feel like you're not making the right substitutions. You're not making the right changes. I think Sandro has 100% hit the nail on the head every single game this year with the guys he's bringing in late. We've already seen injuries really, really early. 35 minutes in, uh, Jared Stroud got got taken out. Um, replace him. Lewis Morgan, plug him right in, and he was fit. He was ready to go. So I think everyone on this team knows what they are supposed to do. I think it is, you know, that beginning of the season bump, uh, that maybe the new coach bump right now, but everything looked looks the best I've seen it in years. And, and I said uh, during our own preseason preview, listen, I'm the MLS betting guy. I have to be accurate. I need to know what my team is just like I need to know what your team is what I need to know all the teams in major league soccer and I have to pull myself once in a while out from that bias this Red Bull team is clicking on all cylinders and they're going to be a top four team in the Eastern Conference this year well already uh top four uh right now with seven points through the first three games of the season um you mentioned Emil Forsberg obviously a lot of people sure. knew him from uh, Red Bull, was it uh, Leipzig? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people knew him from his time over with Red Bull Leipzig. Uh, what has he brought to the team? What has the impact that he has coming from one Red Bull team to the other? So I think all the Red Bull teams, they try to play this high energy. And I know we've been made fun of, oh, it's an energy drink team. Yeah, that is our ownership. And, and if we go out playing lazy soccer, it's going to be reflected in that. So Emil kind of knows the system already. I mean, this is a guy who started out with Malmo when he was 20, 21 years old. He came to Leipzig, was promoted to Bundesliga, and played at the top flight of German soccer for uh, eight years, something like that. Uh, Ten seasons with Leipzig. I have it right here. So eight Bundesliga seasons, two seasons before as they were moving up the soccer pyramid in Germany. And I think that what he brings is just age and experience. This is Red Bull team is one of the youngest teams you're ever going to see in Major League Soccer. And they needed a number 10. They needed someone with experience. They needed someone who was happy to be here, not just cashing a paycheck. Emil checks all those boxes. He wanted to come to Red Bull. He knows where in, in his career he is. He's not here to retire. He's here to work hard. And I think that a lot of players respect that already. Uh, set pieces is, is really what is, you know, he has such accurate aim that we haven't seen in a long time. He'll take the long shot when nothing else is open, which is something Red Bulls lacked for three decades probably. Um, he, he's dangerous on set pieces. He's already hit two crossbars, and I have no doubt he's going to score uh, a, a couple this season for sure. Emil Forsberg is almost, in in my mind, underappreciated. We see that he was a very good player in Germany for a long time. He wasn't an all-star. He wasn't some, you know... Uh, generational talent and I think we discount that a bit so many teams are excited to get you know a player from the second division in Peru or you know a young kid coming up in Mexico or you know the the top top flight um the names you might know but I think it's a little underappreciated that Emil Forsberg has played at the top level he's better than all those guys Emil Forsberg is going to be one of the best number 10s in Major League Soccer if he's not already and I think that people are discounting that again because Hey, in the top flight of Germany, he was in the top three teams in Germany for the last eight years. Just because he's not an everyday all-star type guy, I think he's getting discounted a little bit. I think he's even more valuable than people realize. This is like if you took Luciano Acosta and dropped him on your favorite team. This is going to be a huge change, and we've seen it already. Last year, Red Bull, you know, they do the counterattack. They do high energy but they did a cheap version of it. You saw they were committing fouls. They were getting fouled. The play was choppy. That's already smoothed out. And the biggest dif difference between this year and last year, last year you were seeing games 55% pass percentage. Can you imagine anywhere in the world seeing 55% of your passes being uh, completed and you think that that's a big deal? Well, more for em Emil Forsberg has the eye and he has other guys behind him now that are making pinpoint passes. That's also a thing for with Sandro Schwartz. 80% in each match. So they're they're winning the ball back fast, but they're also knowing what to do in transition, knowing, hey, we can hold on to the ball. We're going to wait. Last year, we had no finisher. We had no independent, like that, that moment of brilliance. Emil Forsberg brings that to the team. So no longer can uh, players add a fifth man to the back line and bunker. 
Well, Emil can take you to the box. You know, we saw players like Evander do that last last week for Portland. Um, and that's what he brings to the squad. It's just so valuable. He was the perfect player to fit this team at this moment. So you sort of touched on it a little bit. Um, what has gone right for New York, you know, besides, you know, the buy-in with uh, Sandro and uh, Emil? Well, in much, this game, know, anchoring- we... We could talk about so many things, but in this game, putting the ball in the back of the net is the one statistic that actually matters in winning your ball games. And that's what Red Bull's done. Two wins and a draw against tough opponents. Now, we played Nashville. They had a couple players injured. Dallas actually traveled a little better than we thought they would. But these are the games that you need to put away in the Major League Soccer season. If you're playing a team with a midweek game, you need to take it to them and, t- and, and take a point there. So I think that that's what's been different in just scoring points. Red Bull was one of the worst teams as far as points scored and one of the best defenses. I think if, if we could even take a little bit of that defense, get a little more frisky at the end of games, maybe you know, risk conceding a goal. I know it sounds shocking to someone who wants to play defensive soccer just to be more offensive, and that's exactly what this team needed. This was already a best four defense in Major League Soccer last year. All the numbers, all the metrics show that to be fair. The reason they weren't a good soccer team is because they didn't have offense. If we can keep store scoring, uh, you know, 1.75 goals per game, we're, we're going to go pretty far this year. You talked about, uh, you know, the getting frisky with uh, I think you're talking about the defense and, and whatnot. And, you know, offensively, you know, you have the, the likes of Emil Forsberg. Uh, I believe Van Zier, he's back um, after the nonsense uh, last season. I didn't know if there was something else that happened or whatnot. So many injuries in MLS, by the yeah, way. So, so Dante Van Zier was brought in as one of the top scorers in Belgium, and he was supposed to be our next striker. He made some inappropriate comments on the field that he got. He took a suspension for, and at the end of the season, he got high load. He got flipped over, and I think he had a, uh, a break in his back. I think that's, that's what the injury was. So he's been oh, out yeah. for a long time, and he only started training, I, I believe, the last few weeks of preseason. So we don't know what he brings, and that's the glaring spot on this team. This is the run it back this team got better on the back line Andre Andre Reyes the walking red card got replaced with Noah Isla who has been fantastic not only is he six foot four he's distributing from the back um, so that's going to help us out the midfield has always been great because it's a system midfield similar to what Columbus runs you know Columbus has of course you guys have the best coach in the league and that usually helps you have a couple all-stars but the system is going to be intact you guys can can take on some injuries. You could take on some rotation because Wilfred Nazi is going to put the right players on the field. And I feel like that's what Red Bull does too, with the exception we don't have a striker. We don't have anyone proven in Major League Soccer to put the ball in the net, but they've addressed it over the past few seasons. They keep bringing guys in. They know, hey, Elias Manuel, if it's not working, he's going to be cut. Lewis Morgan can plug right in there. We got a couple new wingers on the team. So although we don't have that, like that big body number nine, I think we're going to find ways uh, to, 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 to score without it. What has gone wrong so far? I mean, obviously, not every team is perfect. Not every team can, you know, be almost perfect like Cincinnati was last yeah. year. Well, well, Timo Werner's not on an airplane to, to, to New York right now. That's, <laughs> that's the first thing that went wrong in my week. So um, it, it's just going to be injuries, as always. Lewis Morgan is coming back. He's not 90 minutes ready yet um, he's been subbed in at halftime I believe twice so far this year so I want to see him at 100% and I really want to see him paired with Dante Van Zier up top I don't I don't want him on midfield anymore let, let, let's graduate to, to the big boys flop the other thing is uh, John Tolkien has been taken advantage of I believe early this is one of the best left backs in major league soccer he got a call up for the U.S. men's national team got picked up a knock somewhere in the preseason and he's not been 100% while I think his distribution, his ability to get up field, pass the ball, has been fine, he seems to be getting turned around on that left flank a little bit this season. And, and I think that that's a place where, you know, just he's young, get your legs under you, get a little healthy. I think in a couple of weeks it's not going to be much of an issue there. <laughs> Tyler's favorite person. I, I, I don't know. It, not taking away his talent. I just have – I don't like his attitude at all. <laughs> That's a surprise. I mean, I, I don't know what about his attitude there is that like like he's he's like a gritty player. He he likes getting after it. 
Um, you know, I, 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 I sat down and talked with him just about two weeks ago. Um, he's completely bought into the system and he's actually doesn't really want even a lot of attention on him. I talked to him about a couple of things over the back line. All he wanted to talk about was Noah Isla, who we thought was going to be buried in the depth chart behind Andre Reyes. So it, he, he's that guy. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Is it because uh, he gets fouled a lot and you just don't like players who who flop, although his feet get kicked <laughs> out from under every play? Is that what it is? I have no idea, honestly. I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I take it wherever I, I take it wherever. He seems like a nice guy. I, I think mean, we had we had the scarves and spikes on the uh, beginning of the season, and they said the same thing about Aiden Morris. At least one person said it. Yeah. You know, a, you know, just like you know, he's saying that Aiden Morris flops a lot, which Apparently, you can watch the games, and they're trying to take him out. Um, but, you know, I like Tolkien. I miss him with the long hair. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, he, he has almost as much hair as I do right now. But what you have here is, listen, this Red Bull team is a lot different than last year, and I understand people who thought he was flopping a lot. He was getting fouled a lot. Red Bull fouled more than any team in Major League Soccer last year, and they got fouled more than any team in Major League Soccer last year. It's because they were playing high press. They're going 100% all the time. And if you're running full speed and someone clicks your ankle, guess what? You're going down. You're going down hard. I think this year with this system, we're going to see a lot less of that. We've already seen more fluid play, less stoppages, but I think the fact that they're playing a more refined system now, they're going to hold possession now, and I think that they have the players to, you know, it's not like, oh, we can't do anything in the offense, just kick the ball away, retreat, and try to catch them on the counter. No, now now we have a real game plan, and I think a lot of that chippiness is going to, to go away. We're still going to come out at Cincinnati, you know, kicking shins. That is, you lock that in stone. But I think John Tolkien did get a little bit of a bad name. Again, when you're pressing and you're late, we saw what happened with Messi with uh, who, who is it trying to clear the ball last week? Did you, Good boy. Yeah, I'm um, trying, trying to clear the ball and it looked like a foul. Like, no, it didn't really, not to me. That happened to John Tolkien a lot. And I, I think he was on the, the bad side of a lot of uh, plays where he, he was getting hacked. He, there were multiple times where, you know, a penalty was awarded, something like that for, you know, him or Lukinas who was one of our attackers last year. Yeah, yeah, probably they did flop a little bit and turn on Real Madrid, turn on, you know, Barcelona this weekend. You're going to see flopping without contact. Look at Raheem Sterling. I mean, you know, there, it, it happens all over the world. So now looking ahead to uh, number three, taking on number four in the Eastern Conference, Red Bulls, Columbus. Uh, lots of history dating back to the original MLS days, uh, two of the original clubs in MLS um, back when, you know, Red Bull was, was the Metro Stars and the crew had the three construction workers on their on their crest. Um, obviously, Columbus leads the series. Uh, overall 39, 13, 35. Um, the last three matches, however, decided by one goal, two, one Columbus, two, one Red Bull, two, one Columbus. Uh, just what is your thoughts heading into, uh, this matchup? Uh, and what can the Red Bulls do to snag three points at a very tough place to play in lower.com field? My dog just tore something apart. Can I just pause right here and uh, yeah, you're gonna, see yeah, what yeah. we got? Can we resume the recording. Um, what do the Red Bulls have to do to snag three points away from playing in a tough environment that is lower.com field? Yeah, they need to put more balls in the net than Columbus does. That's easier <laughs> said than done. You know, um, <laughs> I like what Red Bulls are doing. See, I'm personally like a money ball guy. I like what St. Louis did last year. If you're down by a goal... You might as well be down by six goals. I think Sandro Schwartz is more one of those managers who, if Red Bull finds themselves down, they're going to throw some out there. Red Bulls are going to win one nothing or lose 3 nothing. Like, I don't think there's really an in-between here. This is not a Red Bull team you want to see after having a midweek match. We saw what this team did when they dismantled Houston. Um, and I think... Uh, I don't think it's going to be cut and dry like, oh, it's in Columbus. You guys just played a tough game against Houston um, yourselves. So I, I think that this game is maybe 60-40 in favor of Columbus. 
I, I think a, a, a tie would be very likely. My, my thing here is going to be the question I ask against Red Bull all year long, which is how are you going to score against this team? What is it that makes Columbus special that they're going to do something that not a lot of teams have done in the past few years, which is score on this Red Bull team? And, and that's really what it comes down to. I think this is a good matchup for Columbus in, the, in this game, to be honest. I think Red Bull... If they want to be a top team in the East, this is the kind of game they need to, to win. They need to win against Columbus at Columbus. That's fine when Columbus has a midweek game. If you guys aren't on top of your game, Red Bull should have a chance. And this is what it's all about in Major League Soccer. Taking these opportunities, taking this weird schedule congestion stuff and sticking it to your opponent. So I think that that's what Red Bull has to do. I think they need to come out firing i think they need to have a plan for what to do if columbus sits back and it's going to be you know emil forsberg and free kicks and that kind of thing so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this game i think red bull is going to be competitive i don't care about the final score i care about the information that's going to be gained because i think at the end of the day these are two of the best teams in the eastern conference and why not get after it you know so last year we saw when uh Nazi, you know, was playing you guys there in New York and the team was out there. He, you know, he talked before the game about Red Bulls as a test and he doesn't like saying too many games are tests. Um, and you, Nazi likes to sit back a little bit. You know, we can see that, you know, from last year and this year. Red Bulls came out in a 4 2 2 2 late in the game and it sort of disrupted Nazi's 3 4 2 1. Is that something that? we can expect from Red Bulls this year, or was that just a, a coach thing? Yeah, I don't think that what the formation on the sheet matters because this, this Red Bull team is going to get pulled into position. Players are going to play where they need to play to get the ball at their feet or to press the guy who's running after them. 4-2-2-2, 4-2-3-1 with you know, one winger cutting inside. I don't really think that that position matters because we know what Red Bulls want to do. They want to catch you in transition. They want to catch uh, a, a nice turnover. Maybe you know you have a goalkeeper who's going to be a little flimsy with the ball, a defender who makes a bad pass, and then they're going to jump on you there. So I'm not concerned much about position. I think Will Nancy will know that. Hopefully you guys are doing a little better than like Charlotte did in the playoffs where they just came unprepared. They're going to press guys. We don't know what's going on. No, you, you guys know what's going to happen here. Um, I'm interested more to see what Columbus crew puts out because that's going to dictate more of where Red Bulls are on the field than whatever the score sheet says. And if you look at the Red Bulls press uh, releases that they put out for the last couple of years, they put a number and a name in alphabetical order and they don't give you like a, you know, system depth chart, something that shows you uh, the positions where a player is going to play. I don't, I don't think that matters much for this team this year. We talk a lot about, or we talked a lot about Emil Forsberg and, and you know um, what he's brought to the team. What is besides him, albeit you know that's probably the biggest name on the team right now. What other player or players could be a big factor in getting the win for the Red Bulls? Yeah, so you have Sean uh Nalis and Noah Isla playing center back right now. I mean, these are two guys who are six foot four each, they're probably one of the tallest pairings of center backs in Major League Soccer. Great in the air, and while Sean Nalis is more uh of a traditional center back. I guess he's, he's a little mobile. Uh, Noah Isla is going to be the guy who's co coming up, getting the ball, pushing it upfield. Um, he's not afraid to play out the back. He's not afraid to send a long ball forward either. So I want to watch how this particular center defensive back uh, pairing pairs against Columbus, who has Cucho Hernandez, Diego Rossi, those players. Uh, this is going to be, like I said, this is a test for Red Bull this year. This is going to be, you know, can we shut down this offense? I think that's the first question. The first question for an away team has to be, how do we shut them down on offense? And I think two big guys who are going to catch up to you, uh, Frankie Amaya, Daniel Edelman, who've been playing great defensive midfield so far, uh, you know, kind of push that back four into a back six when you need to. I think that that is going to be uh, where I'm going to be paying attention the first half of the game. And then in the second half, just can we counter? Can we put a, ball, uh, a point on the board? Can Elias Manuel score anything can Dante Van Zier be 
a contributor on the score sheet? Is it going to be Lewis Morgan and Emil Forsberg all season long? Is this going to be, uh, you know, flinging into the middle, look for a header? Is this going to be take your long shot? What what are we looking? Are we going to walk the ball in the net? I want to know a lot. And there's a lot of players that I guess like every, Carlos Cornell, you know, one of the unsung goalkeepers in Major League Soccer. He had a terrible beginning of the season last year, giving away some really, really, really rough goals, um, you know, with his feet oftentimes. Um, he seems to be back and gunning at it. So there's a lot of players here. Maybe there's a little lack of, of those superstars, but it's just, it's depth, it's system. And when you see one striker get subbed out, if you see a midfielder get subbed out, they're getting subbed like for like with a player who's probably very skilled as well. So I don't think that there's any, I think we've, we've talked about the, the big guys, Lewis Morgan, Emil Forsberg on offense and, uh, you know, defense could win the day. I mean, if Red Bull gets out with a 1-1 win, I think that that is a victory in the eyes of everyone in New York. So flipping it over to Columbus, who for, you know, besides Cucho and Diego, um, it's kind of hard slowing them down. Who else from Columbus is something that the Red Bulls have, you know, have to look out for? Darlington Nabby. Uh, it's got to be someone who can get the ball out of his feet as fast as anyone else on the field. Uh, Darlington Magnagby, you know, he, he's he's as good a square passer as anyone in Major League Soccer. He can push the ball upfield, and he's good at making those split-second decisions. I wouldn't be surprised to see someone shadowing Darlington Nagby or very close to it, just trying to get two guys on him at all times because he's so good at that decision-making, spreading the ball around. I, I actually like a lot of matchups in this game, like for like, uh, especially in the midfield there. But Darlington Nagby, I mean, that's the class of Major League Soccer right there, right? I mean, if we're if we're making the Mount Rushmore, Darlington Nagby's on it at this point, right? Wholeheartedly agree. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, prediction time. Uh, obviously, you know, I kind of think I know where you're going with it, but I mean, uh, it, it's. It's going to be a hard match for sure. Um, obviously, Gerald Mina will make our predictions uh, uh, when we do when we record the show. Obviously, um, but prediction, Bob, for you, um, taking into the fact that Rebels are on the road, playing, will be playing in, probably in front of a sellout crowd at Lower.com Field. Uh, I'm not sure what the weather is going to be like. It's Ohio. Ohio has shitty ass weather. Fifty nine. Okay, so it's going to be kind of cool, maybe kind of warm a little bit. So but that's fine. It's 59 today. I have my windows open, you know, like that's not <laughs> it's a big like deal. 70 something. I have windows open too. So, um, but what is your prediction for the match uh, on Saturday? So I just want to clarify one thing that you keep going to. You keep talking about how you're a home team. And Red Bull was better on the road last year. And it's because of this press, we look for you to make mistakes. We want you to come and be aggressive. And that's when Red Bull plays at their best. So I don't care that you're at home. I don't care that there's fans. That doesn't really bother me because we have professionals on the field. Like Emil Forsberg's never heard anyone boo him before in his life. Like, no, of course they have. Um, so I think the team is actually better on the road. I would hate to see Columbus play at Red Bull and just close the doors and let nothing happen all game. I have to go and say that the most likely result is a 1-1 draw. I think that that's what we're in to see this weekend. However, Red Bull is plus 280 in the sports book, and Columbus Ooh. Crew is almost even money. So I think there's some money to be won on this match either way. I'll probably dab a little bit on Red Bulls. Not a faith pick, but, you know, one of those, you know, a cup of coffee money, you know, just to see if you can... Uh, cash out a little bit. So, yeah, it's going to be a great weekend. I, I really looking forward to this game. This is going to be a big test for both teams. And I know people watching your show right now are like, this guy's a homer. I'm usually the most negative about my own team that you can possibly find. I like this specific Red Bull team. So I wouldn't discount it. If Columbus comes out and blows their doors off, Columbus is as good team is going to be, you know, top of the conference this year. And I think if Red Bull uh, can play their game plan, Say, hey, guys, Columbus, you guys are tired. Come run. Come run at us. Let's let's go. Uh, we'll take it to you for 90, 95 minutes. And I think that, uh, you know, 1-1 one, one drop, most likely the, the, the best possibility, probably for both teams. You know, you guys do have a midweek game and a team like Red Bull. They're known for just run, 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 run. So we'll, we'll see, I guess. I, I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, you, you mentioned, you talking about the home team and whatnot, is – 
one thing that Wilfred Nancy likes to do is he or the team likes to do actually is have the opposition kind of adjust to how Columbus plays, right? So it's it, especially when when we're at home, you can just see. Uh, at least I can see. I don't know if Jared can see. You can see from minute one how a team plays to minute twenty to now. Okay, now I see adjustments and whatnot to you know forty five and whatnot. That the opposition is definitely uh, changing along the way, right? So, um, but I just, I I totally I totally get what you're saying because Columbus was shit on the road last year, man. And and they were shut on the road the year before that. It was it was terrible. Um, our only good time is when we're at home. So, um, but I mean, good. Just keep in mind though, too. You know, it even though we are at home, and you know, like you said, we have professionals on the field. They've heard boos. Lower dot com, you know, is a dip. It, it's hard to explain without being there. You know, with the sellouts. With it being only twenty thousand, but the way the, the the stadium is set up, a lot of teams they don't like coming into Columbus just because of the acoustics, right? So it's hard to communicate. Listen, I never met anyone in Jersey who ever's back down to anyone in Ohio. That's all I. That's, <laughs> hey, that that's actually fair though. That's that's fair. Um, so Bob, to round out the segment, to round out the show, actually. Uh, we do a little game on the show with uh, ourselves and every guest that we have. Um, it's called Yellow Card, Red Card. So it does not have to be soccer related. Uh, you are giving a yellow card to something totally random. Or if you want to make it soccer related, you can. A yellow card is something that you like or sorry, something you don't like, but you tolerate. And a red card is something you absolutely hate. You don't like it. It is your demise. So what would be your yellow card and red card? My yellow card, and I saw this from Minnesota last week, and I, I was very animate about th- uh, this when uh, your, your, your little brothers uh, played Red Bull in the playoffs. I don't like players breaking like the third wall and yelling at fans directly. I don't like uh, Longwane taking his jersey off and putting it in a, player, in, in, in a fan's face while they're giving them the finger. I just think that's inappropriate. I've seen that a lot more now recently than I think I've seen in a long time. I don't like it. I understand these are competitors. They're, they have the adrenaline going, and maybe they shouldn't just take abuse from the fans. That's fine. But you're a professional. Um, you don't have to respond to libated idiots uh, you know, b- b- behind a wall. So I think that's my yellow card, and I, I've, I haven't talked about that much. I know I didn't say anything about it uh, this past weekend, but I, I, it still you know, burns me up when Cincinnati seeing what they did to the uh, Red Bull fans at the end of the game, like celebrate amongst yourselves. You guys made an accomplishment. That's for you to celebrate, not to gloat in front of someone else. I think it's a bad look. I think it's tacky. Yeah. I, that's all right. We, we took care of them for you guys, you know, I, I, I hated that. I, I, you're talking about the, after the PK shootout, right? Yeah. They ran to the fans and they were like, yell, no, throw the beers at us. And yeah. And, uh, taunting there were some really like obscene gestures going on too some really strange things uh matt miazga who's just an idiot yeah that's fair yeah he is um so what would be your story i actually i know about idiots because me and matt miazga went to the same high school actually uh the same uh yeah not together i'm 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 10 years but yeah wow no shit that's crazy wow was he still an asshole back then I don't know. I, I never, I never, like, I, I might have seen him around town or something, or maybe like at a soccer game, but I'm, I'm 10 years his senior. I know people who went to high school with him, and, and, um, you know, I'm not going to blow up his spot. I, I, I probably would have been a jerk in high school. You probably could get people to slander things I've done too. Fair. Yeah, but you've grown. <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Uh, so, Bob, what will be your red card? Red card. Um, I mean, right now, the only thing that like that really gets me going is like politics, and I don't want to get too political on here. Um, just people who are okay with the end of America. Fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, where can the kind people of our show find you at? 
You can go to uh, at I80 underscore sports on Twitter. You can search the designated pundits on your favorite podcast app or go to youtube.com backslash I80 sports. Every week, every Tuesday, we do a recap of what happened in the league. And every Thursday, we do a uh, sports betting, one of the only sports betting shows based solely on Major League Soccer. So you can find that Thursday uh, night, 930. And then Saturday, we're usually at the in the press box at the Red Bull game, tweeting out, sending sending that love out there. So, you know, just come come find me. Uh, if you have something good to say, come come find me. If you have something bad to say, come find me even faster. I'm going to have to subscribe to the channel so I can listen to the, to the betting thing. I'm, I'm I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Because my MLS bets are shit. I, I I bet I bet you guys have some good knowledge to to throw away. So yes, but you know, betting is a fool's errand. If anyone could tell you they yeah. could do it every time a hundred times, they would uh, not be podcasting at five forty five <laughs> on a uh, on a Wednesday night. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of guests that we bring in and a lot of insight it's great to be able to take a step back and say i'm not a fan today i need to be realistic about what's happening on the field to all these teams that i have very strong opinions on it it kind of makes you you think you know at at kind of a deeper level you're you're not going the service level you need to to consider all things and and how the teams match up and kind of take a coach's approach to it It, it's a lot of fun Mm -hmm. yeah well, it, it's it's funny because uh, we're you you know talking about betting and all that, and I was talking to Tyler last week. Three out of my uh, ticket that I put in, you know, one, and that was uh, Montreal beating Inter Miami, even though you know I got told you know Inter Miami was going to beat them. Great and odds then, on that, like plus four hundred or something like that. Yeah, and then uh, Colorado beating Real Salt Lake, and then of course you know. Columbus crew putting out the fire. So, yeah, that doesn't happen often. Doesn't happen often. I do maybe five or six picks uh, a week. I write an article. I give four. I uh, my co-host gives you know two or three, and we take take the the best and and punch, punch them out every Saturday. So that's it's a lot of thing. It's a it's a huge market that's about to explode. So you know, get on the ground level. Give give us a a call and let us know. All right, I'll be there. Bob, thank you so much for doing this, man. Appreciate the time, and uh, hopefully uh, we both are happy with a result at least uh, on Saturday. Unlikely, this- but thank you so much for having me. I appreciate right. it. Right. <laughs> this has been the Wiseman Say Podcast. Bob Rayama Media, Ty Fish, alongside Gerald Lucas and Bob Ventimiglia. Gerald, my friend, as tradition goes, Wiseman Say. Only fools rush in. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe, stay hydrated, and go crew. Stay wise.